Shalom, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is the homily for the solemnity of Epiphany. The theme that I've chosen for this Sunday is the three kings and the three prophecies. The image that you are looking at, it is called a temple stone. It is remarkable that this stone that comes from the ancient Jewish temple hasn't been carried away far from its original location. Charles Simon Clermont Ganyu wrote about his 1871 discovery. Indeed, the place where I found it is only 50 meters away from the Haram al-Sharif, the sanctuary of the Jews. Ancient Temple Mount Warning Stone is the closest thing we have to the Temple of Jerusalem built by King Herod. Carved in bold Greek letters, 2,000-year-old Herodian inscription marked off the section of the Jerusalem's most sacred site where Gentiles couldn't go and shows they were welcome elsewhere in the holy area. Can you believe uh, this is the exact stone Jesus would have seen when he visited several times the Jerusalem temple? The unassuming slab of limestone that you see on the right side doesn't look like much. It is crudely fractured and chipped on the sides, uh, pockmarked with age, and is perched not too prominently on a shelf at the Israel Museum. If we talk about the closest thing to the temple we have, said David Mavarak, senior curator of Hellenistic, Roman and Byzantine archaeology, on the Temple Mount, this was the closest, the Temple Stone. Two millennia ago, 2,000 years ago, the block served as one of several do not enter signs in the second temple in Jerusalem, delineating a section of the 37-acre complex which was off-limits for the ritually impure Jews and non-Jews alike. In the modern world, we use signs or sign boats, but those days they used stone. So the stone that you see written in Greek, it's very simple. Instruction to the Gentiles, do not enter. It's a sacred site. There are actually two extant copies of the warning notices. A partial one is in Jerusalem at the Israel Museum and a second is in Istanbul Archaeology Museum. And there are among a small handful of artifacts conclusively belonging to the shrine built by Herod toward the end of the 1st century BC. The exclusion of the Gentiles, according to the inscription, is a kind of compromise between allowing them into the temple but still excluding them from the inner temple which is the properly holy ground. Because based on the instruction of Moses, no Gentiles are allowed in the Jerusalem temple. Totally. No. No Gentiles can come inside. But Herod made a compromise so that the Greeks can also come inside and it will also make a lot of revenue. Despite the Herodian era status quo, in which Gentiles and Jews mingled atop the Temple Mount. Most rabbis today maintain the tradition that the entire complex is holy ground and Gentile entry is forbidden. Echoing the ancient temple warning inscriptions that you see in the stone, Israel's chief rabbi published warning signs, including one of the Mugrabi Bridge leading to the Temple Mount after Israel assumed control of the site in 1967. According to the Torah, these signs stated it is forbidden for any person to enter the area of the Temple Mount due to its sacredness. So this temple stone proves the fact that Gentiles are not allowed to come closer to the Holy of Holies or the holy place or the place where the priests sacrifice the um, animals. You might be wondering what is the connection between temple stone and the feast of the three kings? For that, we need to look at today's first reading and two more prophecies of prophet Isaiah. The scene of the manger in Bethlehem. Have you ever wondered why do we have in a manger scene an ox and a donkey? It is because of the prophecy of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3, we read, An ox knows its owner and an ass its master's manger but Israel does not know my people has not understood so Isaiah prophesies very clearly the Messiah will come the animals will know 
where the Messiah is, but not the Israelites. So, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, verse 11, verse 12, we read, For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you, who is Messiah and Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find an infant wrapped in a swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So why Luke is specifically mentioning about the lying in a manger is proving that Jesus' birth in a manger proves the prophecy of Isaiah. The child who the animals see is not just a baby, is God incarnate Jesus Christ. The gifts on the camels. In the second prophecy, today's first reading, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 to 6. The title of this passage is called The Glory of God's Church. Let me read out to you, first of all, this beautiful, powerful prophecy from Isaiah. Rise up in splendor, Jerusalem. Your light has come. The glory of the Lord shines upon you. The glory of the Lord here, the Shekinah, the, the presence of God, shines upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick clouds cover the peoples. But upon you, the Lord shines and over you appears his glory. The glory of the Lord appeared. Nations shall walk by your light and kings by your shining radiance. Understand the word nations, goyem. So all the Gentiles were called, translated in English as nations. So the Gentiles shall walk by your light and kings by your shining radiance. Raise your eyes and look about. They all gather and come to you. Your sons come up from far and your daughters in the arms of the nurses. Then you shall be radiant at what you see. Your heart shall throb and overflow. For the riches of the sea shall be emptied before you. The wealth of nations, once again Gentiles, shall be brought to you. Caravans of camels shall fill you. Dromedaries from Median and Ephah, all from Sheba, shall come bearing gold and frankincense and proclaiming the praises of the Lord. I have to admit, I have so many years thought about this particular passage has been given to us on the Feast of Epiphany, especially for the sake of the word gold and frankincense, because the three kings brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that is why I thought. But the reason why the church has given this reading is to say that this prophecy is fulfilled in the birth of Jesus when he was born in Bethlehem, because the three kings came and visited, because that is what this passage says. The nations, the Gentiles will walk by the light and reach the presence of God. So, to put it in simple words, what Isaiah has prophesied here is that when Messiah arrives as a baby, the Gentiles will come from afar to see the king and later the lost tribes of Israel to encounter this king. So, first the Gentiles will come and then the lost tribes, the ingathering of the lost tribes will take place. Notice here in this prophecy, the Gentiles come first and then the lost ones, that is the Israelites. Prophecy number three. The Gentile priest of God. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 18 to 24. This is one of the most beautiful prophecy of Isaiah. Let me read out to you this prophecy. I am coming to gather every nation. This is God who is talking through Isaiah. I am coming to gather every nation. Once again, the word nation refers to Gentiles. Every Gentiles and every language. They will come to witness my glory. I shall give them a sign and send some of their survivors to the nations. To Tashish, Put, Lud, Meshach, Tubal and Javan to the distant coast and island that have never heard of me or seen my glory. So uh, what Isaiah is prophesying here is the Gentiles will come to me and I will send the Gentiles also to different corners of the world to worship the one God of Israel. They will proclaim my glory to the nations, to the Gentiles. And from all the nations, they will bring all your brothers as an offering to Yahweh on horses and chariots and litters, on mules and on camels to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. Yahweh says, like Israelites bringing offerings in clean vessels to Yahweh's house. And some of them I shall make into priests and Levites, Yahweh says. So, this is actually one of the fantastic prophecies from Isaiah. 
instead of me giving the reflection, Dr. Bran Petre gave this beautiful explanation based on this passage. Now, it's hard for me to capture in words just how shocking that prophecy of Isaiah is. Because he's not just describing the conversion of the Gentiles or the subjugation of the Gentiles, like Israel will conquer the pagans and they will lord it over them. He's describing there that the Gentiles will not just turn to the one God of Israel. They will see his glory, but he will take some of them to be priests and Levites. The idea that pagans would one day become priests of the one God of Israel is almost inconceivable. But that's how the book of Isaiah ends. My brothers and sisters, I showed you the temple stone which said, which prohibited the Gentiles cannot come into the sacred place. But what Isaiah says, the Gentiles will become priests and deacons, Levites, and they will serve God. The one God of Israel. If you are a first century Jew and you are living under the Roman occupation, you know from scripture that one day the Gentiles are going to turn to the Lord. But to see it actually happen, to see that take place, would be something that would be almost inconceivable. Israel and the Gentiles will now be united in one church, the church of Jesus Christ, the church of the Messiah, the one holy Catholic church. That is the mystery which for centuries has been hidden. It just wasn't visible. It didn't seem like it was even possible. But now, through the coming of Jesus, it has been made known. It has been revealed. It has been unveiled. The solemnity of Epiphany celebrates one of the first manifestations of that. The Gentiles coming to God. And it's the coming of the wise men to the child Jesus in Bethlehem. Because these wise men represent the wise among the pagans. In fact, the pagans are going to begin to turn and to see the light that the baby Jesus brings into the world. That the Christ child brings into the world. This is something most Christians in our day, we just take it for granted. Well, of course, there are billions of people throughout the world from every continent on the earth and from every country on the earth who worship Jesus of Nazareth and with him, the one God of Israel. But in the first century, that was something that was almost inconceivable. I mean, yes, the prophets said it, but it's one thing to have a prophecy. It's another thing to see the prophecy fulfilled. And so in the early centuries of the church, the conversion of the pagans, the Gentile nations, was one of the motives of credibility for believing that Jesus of Nazareth wasn't just one more guy claiming to be someone. He wasn't just one more self-proclaimed prophet or one more self-proclaimed Messiah. And like these other ones, Jesus actually brought the prophecies to fulfillment. He brought the Gentiles to worship the one true God of Israel through him. That is why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen.